Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Michael Lofton of Reason and Theology and Catholic apologist and frequent um, uh, contributor to the show, Matthew Lavagna. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for coming out to the show today. Uh, our theme is going to be interpreting the magisterium. Um, and so I've had both of these gentlemen on before. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we have to do introductions this time around. Um, but I want to ask Michael just kind of a, a starting question that's going to help us frame the discussion. A lot of people think that when the Catholic Church teaches something, it just teaches it full stop, right? Mm. And so, like, you know, if the, if the church says something and later it kind of maybe changes its mind, people will say, isn't that proof that the Catholic Church isn't infallible? And so there's this assumption that everything is taught with the same degree of authority. Mm. Uh, can you clarify what's going on here in the Catholic Church? Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent observation. Um, I think that that's definitely the case with the most, uh, the majority of uh, people and the way they perceive the magisterium. So, of course, there are different levels to the magisterium. There are different degrees of authority by which it teaches. Um, and so that concept, like you said, is something that a lot of people overlook. And so they kind of think that it's an on and off switch. If it teaches, it teaches definitively. And that is not necessarily the case. Um, in fact, there are quite a few teachings of the magisterium that are their authentic magisterium. They, they truly do come from the shepherds of the church, and they do have um, the uh, authority from Christ to teach, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're teaching definitively. There could be quite a few instances in which they're teaching non-definitively. So, in fact, this is one of the areas that I'm, I'm writing about in my dissertation, and that is magisterial reversals. Um, can the magisterium reverse some of its prior teachings? Right, that, that would be the question. And if the magisterium teaches in certain instances non-definitively, which it does, it even indicates itself that it does, uh, so that's beyond dispute, then it follows, if it's teaching non-definitively, that it, in theory, could be reversed. Now, whether or not there ever has been a reversal, that's where the debate is. But could the magisterium reverse something and still be um, credible? Yes, absolutely. Because as you note, there are different degrees of authority by which it teaches, and many of them are non-definitive. Yeah, and the second thing I want to mention is that um, some people have complained that, um, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't you Catholics have figured this out by now? <laughs> um, you know, like, shouldn't you have all the nice, neat rules for like interpreting the magisterium in place? Why are you still figuring this out? Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think is this I mean, there's this idea, right, that the church is this living society. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we I mean, we had councils from the beginning. And then as time went on, you know, we you know, we could uh, figure out the structure right in the history of the church. And then we figured yeah. out more and more how to interpret it and so on and so forth. But the church is a living society. Yeah. Um, and so could you kind of expand upon the relevance of that to, yeah. you know, this, like, why are we still having this debate or we're still trying to figure these things out? Well, so two things. Number one, I don't think that there's as much debate here as, as a lot of people would suggest. So I, I think that there are clear cut rules in many of the instances where people think are, you know, issues in dispute. Uh, but number two, you're, you're right. We do grow in our understanding of the deposit of faith. I mean, we're, we're not adding to the deposit of faith as Catholics, but um, it's definitely true that we grow in our understanding of it and realize some of its implications. There, there, there's zero way that you could defend the veneration of icons from the Second Council of Nicaea without that concept. You have to recognize that, unless you really believe that St. Paul was bowing down to icons venerating them, which I, I don't think could be defended historically. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, we're going to grow in our understanding of the deposit of faith, and part of that is going to be growing in our understanding of how the magisterium itself, the teaching authority of the church, works, which we have been doing for 2,000 years. But again, that being said, I think that we are at a point where there are quite a few rules that are established um, and that are not in dispute. So I, I don't think the situation is as shaky as a lot of people would present it as. All right, that's a good clarification, Michael. Mm. Uh, now, Matthew, you're going to start off by just giving out some questions to Michael. And so, uh, Matthew, whenever you're ready, you just go right on ahead. Sure, thank you, Swan. So, uh, I was going to ask questions about what is generally disputed today amongst Catholic mm -hmm. theologians mm -hmm. uh, concerning specific examples of texts that are considered to be either uh, ordinary and universal magisterium or mm -hmm. authentic magisterium. 
And one of these texts, important texts, is uh, Humanae Vitae. So there are theologians who have argued that this text is infallible since it's part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. And others, um, like Jimmy Aiken in his book, Teaching with Authority, that we have here, um, mm -hmm. defends the view that uh, it's part of the authentic magisterium and that it requires the submission of will and intellect as Lumen Gentium 25 teaches. And so I want to have your stance on this. What do you think? Yeah, so there, there's two different options, as you noted there. One is a person could say that um, Humanae Vitae, what it teaches is authentic magisterium, yet non-definitive. So that would mean that it, it truly is authoritative. It truly does come from the shepherds of the church who have authority to teach. So it's authentic magisterium. Um, yet it would be non-definitive. In other words, it would be a teaching that could be reversed by the magisterium later on. I mean, no individual has the authority to reverse anything that's non-definitively taught by the magisterium, except the magisterium itself. Um, so there, there's that position. And that position effectively maintains that humane uh, vitae is non-definitive for several reasons there's different arguments out there I'm, I'm not sure exactly what uh jimmy aiken's argument is but i know sullivan um i think part of his his dispute is that there there's what's called secondary objects of infallibility which could be taught infallibly by the church so that is their their teachings that are not explicitly or even implicitly in scripture um, but they are so immediately connected to something that is explicitly or implicitly in scripture that if you deny it, you're denying what's in scripture. So you have to hold that in order to maintain what is in scripture. Those are what's called secondary objects of infallibility, and they're eligible to be taught infallibly by the church. Um, someone like Sullivan is going to say that's not necessarily, the, the, the issue of humane vitae is not necessarily um, within the scope of a secondary object of infallibility because those teachings that could be defined as a secondary object are general principles of the moral law, but not necessarily particular norms. Um, and part of the reason why is he, he seems to take Rahner's view and says that, well, um, you know, there, there might be certain principles that can come from the metaphysical aspect of man, but then there are certain aspects of humanity that are more sociological and are subject to change over history and circumstances and these specific issues such as uh, artificial contraception fall within that latter scope and I, I'm not sure I agree with him now look who am I really to disagree with <laughs> Father uh, Francis Sullivan um, I mean he, he was one of the best theologians in, in my opinion um, but but I guess I just haven't seen enough from him to really persuade me to that perspective. But I recognize that's a legitimate perspective if somebody wants to say that um, this is a, you know, art, the illicitness of artificial contraception and humane vitae is non-definitively taught by the authentic magisterium. I, I, I don't think that they're a heretic. I don't think that they're evil. I, I, I just would say I, I don't necessarily agree. I think that I'm in the other camp, which says, um, that what humane vitae is expressing is part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. In other words, it's just repeating that which has been um, already definitively taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And just for reference for anybody who's not familiar with the ordinary and universal magisterium, the concept to this is that this is the consistent teaching throughout the ages of the bishops in union with Rome. It's not necessarily something that you can find in one particular place. So it's not something that you could find in a solemn definition in an ecumenical council. If it were that, it would be a solemn definition, not a, the ordinary and universal magisterium. What's distinctive about the ordinary and universal magisterium is that you can't find it in any one particular place like a solemn definition. But it is something that is more implied and consistently preached and taught um, by the bishops throughout the ages and taught as something that is definitive, not subject to um, reform. I, I would agree with the minority report um, that was part of the commission 
that led up to Humani Vitae. Paul VI uh, had a commission that was to research the issue prior to the release of Humani Vitae. And the minority report came out and noted, look, this is, this is part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. So really it's, it's beyond dispute. I would agree with them. But if somebody were to say, well, here's why I think it's non-definitive and it's not part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. And I do think it's subject to reversal in the future. I'd hear them out. It's just, I haven't heard anything convincing yet. Sure. And would you say that they, the same thing with issues like uh, IVF that has been condemned in Donum Vitae? Uh, this, you could arguably say that it hasn't been taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium because mm. it hasn't been preached before. It's a new subject. Uh, and um, But it would be weird to say that, well, it's not infallibly condemned since it's a grave evil. And um, so I see both positions could have a, an advantage here. And it's, I don't know what you think on that. Yeah, th this one I see a little less attestation to historically. I mean, clearly there are some aspects to the case of artificial contraception that are belong to the modern period. But I think the concept behind it is well established prior to then. Um, the case of in vitro uh, fertilization, in vitro fertilization, I think is... Um, a, a little less clear, at least in my mind. And I, I also think another one of the differences when it comes to uh, humane vitae, you have a personal exercise of the papal magisterium. That's not necessarily the case in donum vitae. Uh, you, you don't here have a personal exercise of the papal magisterium. So the document itself, I think, already is a little lower than humane vitae. But you could still say, well, Maybe so, but the teaching itself that it expresses is part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. Maybe, but I would need to see that information, and I, have, I haven't seen it yet. But I do want to note the distinction there. Humane Vitae is a personal exercise of the papal magisterium. Donum Vitae is not. Um, Donum Vitae is, is part of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It was a document released by them. Now, there are two ways in which a CDF document could be accepted by the Pope. One is in common form and one is in specific form. If it's accepted in specific form, that is the Pope expressly accepts line by line everything in there. So it then becomes, it's like he takes the CDF document and makes it his own. It then becomes a personal expression of the papal magisterium. Um, whereas a document that is released in common form, which Dona Vitae is, is it is part of the papal magisterium. So it's authentic, ordinary magisterium. It's not definitive, but it's not a personal exercise of the papal magisterium. So it is going to be a, a notch lower. It is part of the papal magisterium, but it's not papal magisterium as personally exercised by the pope. It's papal magisterium as exercised by those he has delegated to uh, speak on the matter. And, and so it's not necessarily the case that he is approving everything specifically in there. He's just kind of approving the overall idea. And I think Dr. Joy, who I've had on my show, who's done uh, quite a few lectures on the magisterium, has brought that out pretty well. So I, I give him credit for the, um, bringing that out. So again, that being said, I want to say that the document in which uh, this is condemned is, is a little lower but again, somebody could always come back and say, that may be, maybe the document itself is, is pretty low level magisterium, but the teaching that it is simply uh, reaffirming is ordinary and universal. Maybe, maybe. I, I'm still, I, I'm open to uh, uh, considering that. But, we, but here's the thing. Here's the challenge behind that, though. Here's why it's not necessarily so easy. Um, you would have to show that this is the teaching of the bishops in communion with Rome throughout the centuries, and that they have constantly maintained this, and that they maintained it as definitive. At least sure. the principle, right? I mean, obviously, they're not going to be talking about in vitro fertilization in the year 700. Not necessarily. But, um, but the principle behind it, they may be speaking about. But you have, to, you have to establish that. You have to show that. So, though I do want to say that people who say that the, the magisterium is, is loosey-goosey and really hard to identify, I want to say that they're wrong. On the other hand, I do want to say establishing that something is part of the ordinary and universal magisterium, I, I think is possible. I think we've done that quite a few times in church history. 
and are able to demonstrate it, but it's a little bit more difficult than you might think. It's, it's a lot harder to do compared to maybe just identifying a solemn definition in an ecumenical council. And really quick, Michael, could you give us yeah. some examples of the universal ordinary magisterium? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, one, one interesting thing is the popes themselves have given us examples, although there are many. Um, one is the Assumption of the Virgin Mary um, and also the Immaculate Conception. Prior to their definitions by the popes, these things were taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And those are explicitly identified by, uh, by the popes as examples of the ordinary and universal. Um, and, and what's curious there too, is that there, there's quite a few other theologians who would say, okay, well, um, all right, if that's the case, it's not necessarily so that you have to find theologians in every single century attesting to this. If you find it consistently taught just in one century, that's sufficient to explain what was implicit in prior centuries. And, and I would agree with that. And I think that applies for the Immaculate Conception. Because it's, it's definitely clear that the Immaculate Conception was not something explicitly maintained um, by any church father for quite a few centuries. Now, I do think that it did become something explicitly maintained, uh, but I do think that it was more implicitly maintained um, in, in the early part of the first, uh, first millennium. And so I think that's kind of how it explains, well, how could this be ordinary universal magisterium if you don't have an attestation to this in every single century? I mean, number one, we don't have everything that's extant anyway, but number two, you, you actually don't have to have that. If you can just identify a consistent teaching of the bishops in just one century, that's indicative of um, the previous centuries as well. Um, and there, there's, there's some uh, manualists who would, who would back me up on that. Um, so th does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I want to give another one real quick, if, if you don't mind. Uh, one that might be a little bit more tangible for people who perhaps don't accept the Immaculate Conception, maybe for non-Catholics who are watching. Um, the Council of Nicaea is the perfect example. It's, it's the classic example that, um, that uh, different, different theologians, especially in the 19th century, would bring out to identify the ordinary and universal magisterium. Um, prior to Nicaea, could you deny that Jesus is homo usias with Father? No, of course not. Um, but at the same time, it was in dispute among some, and so it was necessary for the uh, church to come and issue a solemn definition in favor of what was already taught in the ordinary and universal magisterium. So when it, whenever things are in dispute, it's necessary that the magisterium steps in and offers a solemn definition to make it beyond dispute that this is already something that was definitive, even if you could have already known that it was definitive prior to the solemn definition by way of the ordinary and universal magisterium, which you could have, uh, because I think that this is something that is in scripture, and it was something that was consistently taught by uh, the bishops prior to Nicaea. Um, so I think that would be a classic example of the ordinary and universal magisterium. All right, back to you, Matthew. Sure. Um, do you believe, like uh, Jimmy Akin and other uh, theologians um, and apologists, that the text from uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis from uh, Pope John Paul II in 1994 uh, that teaches the impossibility of having woman priests and teaching its supposition to be de definitively held. Do you believe that's part of the ordinary and universal magisterium, or do you believe it's an ex cathedra statement, as some theologians have stated? Um, mm -hmm. Do you want me to to give you the to, to no? Give the that's, that's okay. okay. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, and and that but that's part of the debate. All right, so I, I don't exactly recall what um, Jimmy Aiken's perspective here is, but I remember Ratzinger. And what Ratzinger wants to say is, this is not an example of the um, of papal infallibility because this was already something definitively taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And so for Ratzinger, you can't offer a solemn papal definition for something that is already, uh, or at least you, you can't exercise the, the uh, papal infallibility for something that is already established by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And I would say, with all due respect, I, I think that's somewhat arbitrary. Where, where does that rule come from? 
it, it doesn't seem to come from Vatican one. So wherever he gets that from, I, I think he would be obliged to tell us the reasoning behind it. He might be right. He might be right. But I just don't know where he got that rule from. And it's not from the first Vatican council. I think it's adding criteria to Vatican one that is not there in Vatican one. So I think that this is an area where somebody could respectfully disagree with Ratzinger and say that, okay, well, if that were true, yes, this would not be an exercise of the, uh, of papal infallibility, but why should we believe that that's the case? What, what's the evidence? If we're to just apply the criteria of Vatican I for papal infallibility very strictly, I would say that Ordinatio Sacerdotalis does fall within the scope of um, definitive papal teachings. Now, I have, I, I, I recall reading Aiken. I, I don't remember where, in what context he was speaking about, but I remember him arguing that, well, since the Pope doesn't say either in this case or a few others, again, I don't remember specifically which one it was, but he says, since the Pope doesn't say, I define yeah. that it's yeah. not an exercise of uh, the infallible papal magisterium. And I would also say that that itself, I would say, is, is not necessarily required, because at the time of the First Vatican Council, um, when it comes to the criteria that they gave us, all that they gave us is that it has to be manifestly clear that he is definitively proposing something. It doesn't, doesn't give us a specific formula. In fact, when they brought that to Vatican I and said, Let, let's get a specific formula, the council fathers explicitly rejected that and did not want to offer a specific formula. They were just saying it just needs to be sufficiently clear that he is teaching definitively. And I think that was a wise approach, because if you gave a particular formula, everything in the first millennium is probably not going to be eligible. Right. Yeah. Uh, so but but that would be difficult because I think Leo's tone prior to Chalcedon would be an example. So. I think that would cause a lot of problems. So I'm glad they didn't give a specific formula. But I think his counter to that idea is that, but this is the formula that popes use now. So if they don't use it now, um, then it's not a definitive exercise of the papal magisterium. And I would also say, but I think that respectfully, I think that that too is somewhat arbitrary because there's nothing that says there's no rule that says they have to use that formula. I just think that their intention and, and will has to be manifestly clear that they're teaching definitively. And that's definitely the case with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis. I mean, I have the text in front of me. Um, it says this judgment is to be held definitively by all, all the church is faithful. And Jim Yakin says, in order to, for it to be ex cathedra, the Pope would have uh, had to said, I declare I and define that dot dot yeah. dot yeah and uh, so yeah it's, uh, but i guess I, I guess my difficulty with that is where where is that rule stipulated um because when i look at vatican one when they consider the issue of is there going to be one particular formula um they didn't maintain that perspective that there has to be this one formula of i declare and i define and um I, and, I, and I think that uh, when, when was the Immaculate Conception defined? What was it? 18, was it 1864? Shooting off the head. Uh, it was Shoot 1854. The head. I think. Okay. This, this is prior to Vatican I. So they're already familiar with that phraseology, but they specifically rejected the idea that that phrase is going to be used in all cases of the exercise of the papal magisterium, even from, from this moment on. So I would say that the council fathers didn't accept that perspective. Therefore, I'm not going to as well, unless he has another reason to maintain it. And the only reason I heard is, well, because that's how they've done it recently. But it also begs the question, is that the only way they've done it recently? If Ordinatio Sacerdotalis is an example, then no, that's not how they've always done it. So it, it, it kind of begs the question, in my opinion. So I, I'd respectfully just offer some pushback and say, I, I'm not so sure. It, it, it actually might be an exercise of the papal magisterium. Yeah, this is what I would say, too. But the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith said in 1995 that this was actually part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. So this is at the end of the Densinger. You can find it. Uh, but I, I find it hard to understand. Yeah. So, um, yeah, point me specifically to that, because. Um, when you say the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith says that. 
Yeah. Um, um, it's it's at the end of the Denzinger. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Read read the the source of the document for me specifically, if you don't mind. Uh, I have it in, in French, so it's not going to be very helpful. Uh, it's um, Denzinger uh number 5041 yeah just because it's in Denzinger doesn't necessarily mean that it's um somehow dogmatic or, or something like that or even authoritative um the source of that document though is that an exercise of the magisterium that's my no it's the congregation for the doctrine of faith so okay now the the document that we're speaking about there from the cdf was that accepted in forma specifica that's um, the question if it was then okay you have an authentic interpretation of order not sacerdotalis but to my knowledge that's not the case but i could be it wrong it was approved it was approved by pope john paul ii so that's all it a, says a, approved but yeah. in forma specifica is is the question right because you can you can have an approval by the pope in common form um and and it's not necessarily a personal exercise of the papal magisterium now one might push back and say but even something that is accepted in common form is still authoritative so therefore this is an authoritative interpretation of ordinatios or ordinatio sacerdotalis maybe i would i would need to see that specifically i've been trying to look for something like that because i haven't been able to find any kind of authentic um interpretation of it but even if that's the case even if it's not a um example of the infallibility of the papal magisterium it's still ordinary and universal magisterium right so you, yeah. you could so for anybody who were to say, well, OK, but this is an authentic interpretation of the document and it's not an exercise of papal infallibility. OK, it's, it's still to be held definitively by yeah, the yeah, sure. universal magisterium. So you still can't deny it. And I think yeah. that some are I'm not saying Aiken or anybody else, but I, I think that some are saying it's not an exercise of the papal magisterium because they want to deny it and, and, and that's the problem and i don't think that you can come to that conclusion either but i'll take a look at the document um if you don't mind sending it to me uh sure. because if because if it was approved in common form i would still say that that is at least an authentic interpretation but but does it explicitly say that this is yeah. not an example of the papal magisterium in the document Yes, it says um, the question was asked, should we take this uh, new declaration from mm -hmm. Pope John Paul II to be another ex cathedra declaration? And it said explicitly, no, it's part of the ordinary and universal magisterium, dot, dot, dot. Uh, right. And it was approved by Ratzinger and then by uh, Pope John Paul II because they worked mm -hmm. to together at the time. If um, you could send it to me, I'll take a look at it. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, Worst case scenario, it's ordinary and universal. Would you at least agree yeah. that the like everyone agrees it's infallible? The question is just a subtle like, is it a ex, ex cathedra or that's ordinary the debate. And universal? That's the, it all, that's all the ends up the same. Yeah, it, it all ends up in the same place insofar as we would all say it's definitive, and so you can't affirm the contrary. Can't but it. but it's still a good question: Is this an exercise of the papal magisterium? Because we we do want to be able to identify. Um, cases where the papal magisterium has taught definitively. So is it an infallible exercise of the papal magisterium? So it's still a legitimate question worth pursuing. And I'll, I'll take a look at it if you can send it to me. Sure, because there are other examples uh, where, well, I, I think we all agree that the last uh, infallible statements of the church, whether it is ex cathedra or ordinary and universal magisterium, are taught mm -hmm. in Evangelium Vitae, where Pope John Paul II condemns uh, euthanasia and abortion uh, in a very uh, solemn fashion. Uh, and so I think it's uh, Evangelium Vitae, uh, paragraph 57 and 61, I think. And it says uh, explicitly, I declare, uh, therefore, by the authority which Christ conferred upon Peter and his successor, and in communion, in communion with the bishops of the Catholic Church, I confirm that the direct and voluntary killing of an innocent human being is always gravely immoral. This doctrine is based upon unwritten law, which man, in the light of reason, finds in his own heart, is reaffirmed by sacred scripture, transmitted by the tradition of the church, and taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's clearly infiable. Yeah. I so think these are the last uh, like infiable statements we have. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any statements after Evangelium mm. Vitae that are infiable. 
yeah, so the, there, there's three statements in there. In fact, um, Dr. Joy, I want to say a week or two ago, somewhere around there, uh, came on my show and was discussing those specifically. So y'all, y'all definitely take a look at that if you get a chance. But what he argues is that those are exercises of the uh, infallible exercises of, of the papal magisterium due to the fact of, that it meets the criteria of Vatican I, strictly speaking. Now, the pushback on that is, well, um, Sullivan claims that uh, Ratzinger in, I think, Origins, um, says that this was not an exercise of the in, infallible papal magisterium. But the rationale, again, behind that was that the Pope can't um, use his infallible magisterium for something that was already taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And again, going back to what I said previously, I don't, I, I don't know where he gets that from. And, and I, I can't find that in Vatican I, so I do have some difficulty with it. So if that's the rationale behind it, I wouldn't necessarily agree with with Ratzinger there, and I might suggest that okay, maybe this should be considered as um, an exercise of the papal magisterium that is definitive. Um, so th those three cases, to my knowledge, there's no authentic interpretation denying it. If you found something, please let me know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Swan, so, do you want to ask a question, or do I follow up with another one? Uh, yeah, you go ahead and do and do as many questions as you need to do, and then I'll go next. And when I'm doing my questions, you can also chime in. Okay, sure. So uh, my next question would be on uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, yeah. Does the magisterium teach that uh, they have existed as real persons? And so I used to think that, yes, well, it starts in the catechism, uh, paragraph 375. And uh, when I talked about it with uh, Jimmy Aiken on Skype, he told me that, no, this wasn't even part of the authentic magisterium. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, to hear you on this because it seems really weird to me that uh, mm -hmm. uh, you could deny their existence. Like, yeah. I'm not even basing myself on humani generis because we all know that Pope Pius XII uh, condemned polygenism uh, in humani generis because he said uh, we, couldn't, we can't see how we can reconcile this with the doctrine of original sin. But um, it's clear that uh, original sin is a dogma. And if you deny Adam and Eve's existence, then it's really hard to see how you can, you can make sense of uh, what or original sin is. So I would think it has to be logically part of at least the authentic magisterium. But it seems weird to me that you could deny this uh, at all parts of the magisterium. What do you think on that? Yeah, I just want to chime in too and just say that, yeah, I also had a question about Adam and Eve. And so mm -hmm. Matthew, like after maybe Michael will hit the question or not, but let me just hear hear out the answer and then I might come in here. Mm -hmm. um, well, on number one, I, I highly respect Jimmy Aiken and I haven't heard his arguments on, on this particular issue. So I can't I can't speak about his particular perspective, but I, I do really appreciate and value his his um, perspective. So if he says something, I imagine he has some good reasons for it. But I, I can only speak to what, what I know about the subject. Number one, um, I think you said that it was dogmatic. They're, they're real uh, existence. I used to think that, but then since okay. I talked to Jimmy yeah. Aiken about it, okay. he he made me perhaps change okay. my mind because okay. he knows much more things than I. Yeah, do, yeah. Because so. I was going to ask where where was that uh, established as dogma? Um, I, I'm not aware of any kind of solemn definition or anything that says that that's dogma. No, no, it's not defined as a dogma. But I would say it's yeah. parts of the deposit of faith. It starts uh, in scripture. It's also taught in a uh, Pope yeah. Paul the Sixth Creed after yeah. Vatican II. It's taught in the Catechism. Uh, it's taught implied in Romans five. Uh, with so you would Saint say Paul. it's so you would say it's a non-defined dogma. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Like I was just 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 making making sure because I, I'm not aware of it ever being defined. But if you're going to argue that it's a non-defined dogma, oh, okay, that that's that's fine too. It, that that very well could be the case. Um, I would say at the very least, I think that it is authentic teaching of the church that is at the very least non-definitive. Um, you can maybe make the argument that it's a non-defined dogma by way of the ordinary and universal magisterium. I, I can see that argument. But at the very least, I think that you would say you would have to say that it's authentic magisterium and at least submission of intellect and will is to be given to it. Um, there are very rare cases where 
authentic, non-definitive teachings could be one could withhold assent to them. And maybe that's what Jimmy Aiken is doing in this case. And, and if that's the case, he, he's that's that's within his his um the within his ability to do so. I mean, Donum Veritatis, uh, I think it's 20 paragraph 24 gives the example of how you could withhold assent um from authentic non-definitive teachings in very very rare limited cases after you've done plenty of research and still have uh, a considerable amount of um objections to the contrary so maybe that's what's going on and and, and that's possible but I, I would i would at least say that ordinarily though a person should at least give religious submission of intellect and will to this proposition if not a higher ascent and if what you're saying is true, it being a non-defined dogma, you would then, of course, um, give a higher ascent, the, the ascent of faith. Um, but at the very least, we have this submission of intellect and will, I would argue. So I don't agree that it's not part of the authentic magisterium, which I think is what you said. Um, that I, th I think you said Aiken main maintained it wasn't. Yeah, Aiken told me he doesn't even believe it's part of the authentic magisterium because yeah. there's a document approved by Ratzinger um, uh, announcing many theories like uh, having original sin being a collective rebellion against God of many people at the same time and that uh, the term Adam doesn't represent one man but a population. And mm -hmm. That's how these theologians have argued in the um, International uh, Theological Commission uh so and it was approved by ratzinger this is what made me uh doubt but, my initial thoughts um, but so. but just because that that's approved and um i first we would need to see the document to even know if it's it, it itself is authentic magisterium um at, at the very most you would still have a reversal here because i do think that humani generis uh, paragraph 37 does authentically teach the uh, existence of Adam and Eve um, as, as real persons, real individuals. So maybe if you have a, a subsequent document that authoritatively teaches it, you just you might just have an example of a reversal. But that doesn't mean it wasn't authoritatively taught prior. Just because you have a reversal doesn't mean something wasn't authoritatively taught. And I, and I do think what's going on in Humani Generis is at the very least an authoritative, non-definitive uh, teaching. And you might say, however, that, well, the, the proposition considered individually in Humani Generis is um, non-definitive, authentic, but the proposition itself that it's expressing is part of the ordinary and universal magisterium. And so you, you might be able to argue that, but I'm, I'm just saying, considering just what we find in Humani Generis, I would say authentic, non-definitive, and he even goes on to note in the same, actually in paragraph 20 of the same encyclical, that whenever a pope um, decides a matter authentically, even though non-definitively in an encyclical, it's not open for discussion among theologians. And that, that makes sense because whenever you have an authentic interpretation, you're to give submission of intellect and will to it, unless you find that in this particular case, I have good reason to withhold assent. So again, somebody might withhold assent from that. Um, so I don't think that anybody is 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 evil or in sin or something like that if, if they maintain uh, what, what what you mentioned there from uh, Jimmy Aiken. I think that they're able to do that. I would just simply say that um, number one, I haven't seen enough evidence that would allow me to withhold assent, and number two, I think that you could make a good case that this is a non-defined dogma. Um, and number three, I would need to see the subsequent document that allegedly says that it overturns this interpretation. Now, I would grant the magisterium could overturn Humani Generis 37 if it's non-definitive, yet authoritative. An individual could not necessarily overturn that, but the magisterium itself could. So if you have some yeah. kind of subsequent document from Ratzinger saying that this is overturned, I would need to see what level of authority that, authority this is. To be clear, uh, um, Jimmy Aiken is not withholding assent. I think yeah. he believes it, uh, but yeah. he says it's just not part of the authentic magisterium mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be believed uh, at all. And yeah. we have uh, theologians discussing it 
after humani generis, meaning that at least implicitly, uh, this is not part of the authentic magisterium anymore. Uh, yeah, and and so and I, and I think that's a fair position to maintain. I, I don't necessarily a, a, agree with it just yet, but I think that somebody is like Aiken is able to maintain that. Um, but again, I would need to see the subsequent document. What level of authority is this? You said that this it's was just an interpretation the international, uh, yeah, ITC, the, the commission, yeah, yeah, yeah. ITC, of course, is not going to be a, um, magisterial, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to reverse anything from Humane Generis. Um, so, if you have something from the ITC overturning the interpretation of Humane Generis, I would say it actually is it, it can't overturn it now. Maybe you could argue, well, what the IT says, ITC says is consistent, however, still with Humani Generis, because Humani Generis 37 notes that he offers this decision because it doesn't appear to him how one could maintain polygenism and still maintain the dogma of original sin and stuff like that. Well, but just because it's not clear to the Pope doesn't mean that there isn't a way to do it. And maybe the ITC came up with a way. <laughs> so maybe you, we don't even have to put it in the, the context of the ITC overturning anything in Humani Generis to the extent that one could still say Humani Generis is true if there's no way to maintain polygenism uh, without still maintaining these other dogmas. But I have a way, and here it is. That wouldn't then require reversal. And one could still come up with an interpretation uh, that, that asserts otherwise. So that might be where the ITC and, and Aiken is coming from, perhaps. Yeah. And Michael, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, that's part of that was part of my question, actually, on, on Humani Generis, because uh, I think I do have an interpretation that it, it can still get us original sin um, that can get us a real Adam and Eve. I don't deny that at all. But it doesn't require that we all yeah. biologically originated from Adam and Eve. I know that's gotten me heat before, but I mean, like, you know, Father Nicanor Ostriaco and their other Dominican theologians who've kind of gestured yeah. towards something like this. I, I disagree with them to some extent because I don't think Adam is a collective. I do think there was a historical Adam, a historical mm -hmm. Eve, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But to me, it just seems like when he says, for there is no way apparent, I'm like, wait, that's okay. the key. That's the key. <laughs> well, just because it's not apparent to you at that time doesn't mean that there isn't a way that could be mm -hmm. a become apparent to christians later on right mm -hmm. and i think yeah, that's kind of the loophole you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you have to make that consistent with saint paul saying by one man sin in entered into the world and that's going to be really yeah. difficult if you hold to polygenism mm -hmm. um, yeah personally i i don't maintain polygenism and but at the same time i'm willing to in charity um, respect anybody who would as long as they are maintaining certain dogmas that, yeah. that's fine mm -hmm. if you can give me an interpretation of romans 5 and, and some other passages that are uh, consistent with scripture and yet don't necessarily say that adam and eve were specific individuals historically but you could still maintain the dogmas i'll hear you out and and i think that you could maintain that through the uh, little loophole there that you find in <laughs> in uh, Humani Generis, it, that his decision is based on the fact that it's not apparent to him at the time. But if it becomes apparent to somebody who has uh, researched this very well, um, maybe. Yeah. You know, also, Christ, Christ is Christ is called the new Adam and Mary the new Eve, and so yeah. since the, both are individual persons. Yeah. Uh, by reciprocity, you would conclude that uh, Adam and Eve, too, were individual persons. I mean, this is like, um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, by intuition, you can see that. Um, yeah, but I, I think that somebody could offer some pushback there, even, even though I don't maintain that perspective. I do think that somebody could offer some pushback there and say the, the analogy is simply that what was done previously by the uh, first Adam is being overturned by the second Adam. It's not necessarily saying that these, it's not commenting on their historicity necessarily. It's just simply talking about a reverse of what's being done in the economy of salvation. I'm not necessarily buying that argument, but I think that somebody could offer that pushback. Yeah. Cause once again, like I accept the historical Adam and Eve, I accept the doctrine of original sin. Yeah. Um, but then the question of whether or not every human has to be able to biologically trace their origin yeah. to a single couple that 
maybe it's just because I've been polluted by public education. <laughs> I was kidding, but you know, like I, I wanted to originally be an evolutionary biologist. And so it yeah. was really hard. It was a hard sell for me. Yeah. Um, but, but it seems well, like those two concepts go hand in hand though. Which, um, which two, the original sin and the historicity of Adam and Eve? Well, the, the historicity of Adam and Eve and also the concept that everyone goes back to um, Adam and Eve. Um, it, it seems like those kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, yeah. I could be wrong. Maybe you could argue that they're necessarily distinct. Um, in other words, I think that this is within the scope of debate in the Catholic Church. I think that you could debate this. Um, and not be in heresy or not be in dissent from the magisterium. But you, you would have to do a lot of nuancing. You, you would have yeah, to be very yeah. careful in the way that you would express it. So I'm more than happy to accept somebody who, who would disagree with me as long as they're accepting uh, or other things like original sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And Pope John Paul II said in 1994 um, in front of the Pontifical Academy of Science that uh, the theory of evolution is more than a scientific hypothesis, but we must hold that the spirit, the soul, does not come from evolution and uh, is given uh, by at one moment in time uh, to man. And you could argue that this is at this time in history when there became the, well, where there was the first Adam and Eve that was created from um uh like non like a human uh body but we we're, we aren't fully human uh until the soul and the body is united and um, so you could argue the first atom came into existence at this moment but i think somebody from the other side would give pushback and say but what john paul ii there says doesn't ne necessitate an idea that it happened to one person it could happen to a community of people that god gives them a soul at once sure yeah so I think that's kind of the pushback that, that you would get. Again, that's not the perspective I take, but I recognize it's within the bounds of Catholicity for a person to offer that kind of pushback on this particular matter. I think that it would be helpful for the, the church to offer some definitive solemn definitions on these things, but um, I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily going to happen anytime soon. Um, so some of these areas we do kind of have to work through and dispute. Um, some people think that you, you, you have, absolutely have to have a solemn definition on absolutely everything. And, and that's just, again, not necessarily the case. And it's definitely not the way Christians have operated throughout most of history. Okay, so I do have one question that I wanted to ask as well. And so it, it deals with um, extra ecclesium nulla salus. So mm -hmm. no salvation outside the Catholic Church and yeah. how that's been received throughout history. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of this before, but Pope Eugene, um, the fourth dogmatic bull, cantate domino, right? Mm -hmm. And basically he says, I, I don't think I have to read it verbatim. It might help maybe, but mm -hmm. it, it, Michael, if you want me to do it, I can do it, you know, after I ask the question. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to be pretty clear. I mean, I mean, speaking on behalf of the Holy Roman Church, firmly mm -hmm. believes, professes and preaches, right? And then mm -hmm. it goes on to say that those who are existing outside of the Catholic Church, Mm -hmm. And it goes into heretics, schismatics, um, any just simply anybody who's not Catholic, um, that they, you know, have no, they, I mean, their eternal fire awaits them. And then, um, you know, he talks more about how nobody outside the ecclesiastical body can profit mm -hmm. from the sacraments of the church, uh, and so on and so forth. And so it seems as if, and then he even says at the bottom there, that, um, you know, no one, even if he pours out his blood for the name of Christ can be saved unless mm -hmm. he remains within the bosom and the unity of the Catholic Church. Some people have said, dang, I mean, <laughs> one is that this kind of throws out maybe Vatican too, when it's kind of saying, I think, was it Lumen Gentium, when it's kind of saying like, right. oh, maybe, you know, invincible ignorance, right? And it's like, nope, if you're not in the Catholic Church, bam, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, just dead and center right there. How would you respond to someone who makes this objection? Yeah, I mean, it's an, an objection that I, I had to raise at one point as well in considering Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council. So it's a fair question, but I don't think that I don't think that there's a contradiction here. I don't even think that there's a reversal. I think that what you find in Lumen Gentium is true and what you find in Florence here is true. I think both of them are true. Um, the problem is the idea of how to understand outside the church. So the uh, the bull notes, it firmly believes, professes, and preaches, which that 
formula right there, I would say does put this within the scope for, for Florence, at least since they, in Florence, they're not issuing any canons and anathemas. Um, so for Florence, that kind of language does seem definitive. Um, but, uh, you know, so somebody might push back and say, well, it's, it's non-definitive and maybe offer some arguments there, but I, I don't maintain that position. I do think that when it says it firmly believes uh, it's the ascent of faith that's required for, you know, things that are to be believed. So uh, I think that that is definitive. But, um, but notice what it says. It firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, uh, you know, pagans, Jews, schismatics, unless they are joined to the Catholic Church before the end of their lives, um, you know, basically can't be saved. Notice the key words, who are outside of the church unless they're joined to the church. Well, not everyone who is not formally, you know, admitted into the Catholic church is, that, is, is not a Catholic. There are some Catholics who are not formal members of the Catholic church. Um, that is Catholicism 101. We've maintained that for a very long time when it comes to um, martyrdom of, of of blood. Uh, so you have martyrs who um, have not been baptized yet, but they're martyred for Christ. We've considered them historically as Christians, um, as Catholics. Uh, somebody who is a catechumen who hasn't reached the baptismal font but dies, we would consider them a Catholic. Uh, so that's baptism of desire, of course. Um, so we would say that there are ways in which you can participate and be a member of the Catholic Church without being a formal member. Now, being a form formal member is the ordinary way, um, but are there exceptional cases? Yes. I mean, that's been established for, I would say, for 2,000 years, it was implied in some of our teachings, but it became explicit with the discovery of the New World for the last 500 or so, 600 years, or yeah, 500 years. Um, it's, it's, it's been much more explicit on part of our theologians and the magisterium itself that one could be a member of the Catholic Church informally and still receive the graces of salvation that are necessary to enjoy God in the beatific vision without being a formal member. So, of course, those who are outside of the church can't be saved. But what does it mean to be in the church? To be joined to the Catholic Church as a sister. What does it mean to be in the church and joined to it? You could be in the church and joined to it without being a card carrying formal Catholic. Um, and so a person who is not a card carrying Catholic through no fault of their own. So, very strictly speaking, um, they might be, for example, a material schismatic, right? Um, maybe they're part of a church that has a bishop that's not in communion with Rome, but they're born into it. It's not a formal decision that they made to separate from Rome. So they're not a formal schismatic, and they haven't added any form to their schism by consciously, consciously rejecting uh, sufficient reasons to be in union with Rome. Um, so they would technically be in material schism. But somebody who's technically a material schism can still be joined to the church and saved in the same way that you could technically be a material heretic as a Catholic and still be saved. You're not adding any form to your heresy, unless we're going to argue that no um, uh, materially heretical Catholic could ever be saved, which would be absurd because that would mean most, most Catholics could never go to heaven, right? Unless you just get an A on your theology exam, right? Um, so if they're not adding form to their schism or even maybe heresies, um, that doesn't put them outside of the church. And it is possible that God could unite them to his church by giving them the Holy Spirit, perhaps through baptism. Uh, obviously, baptism could be um, the grace of baptism could be given through desire, but ordinarily it's given through the sacrament. Um, perhaps they could be joined to the church through the sacrament or the desire thereof, as Trent puts it. Um, and given the theological virtues, and they're following their conscience, um, and they're, they're following the light that they have. That's possible. And what happens if they're martyred? It's possible that they too would um, enter into the beatific vision afterwards. So I, I don't think that any of this that we find here in Florence 
is overturned by Vatican II because Vatican II is talking about those who are martyred, who are part of the church. Florence is talking about those who are martyred, who are outside the church. I think it's talking about formal schismatics and formal heretics. If you're a formal schismatic and you're a formal heretic and you are martyred, yeah, you're right. It doesn't do you any good because you still have grave sin on your soul. I mean, what good is it to be martyred if in the process of being martyred, you're fornicating or something like that? I mean, it just what good is it at that point? You still have other grave sin on your soul, but somebody, again, who doesn't have that grave sin of formal schism or material heresy could be joined to the church in an extraordinary way. And if they're martyred, I think that's what Vatican II is talking about. Yeah, I mean, and and just a thought that I had, too, is that, you know, um, <clears throat> nobody is saved insofar as, let's say, they are anything but Catholic, right? So, for instance, take our Orthodox friends. Like, we believe that they have real sacraments. They have valid holy orders, right? Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> we would believe, Michael and Matthew, that when they get to heaven, it'll become apparent that, okay, yeah, the, the, the Roman yeah. Catholic Church was, yeah. was the one true church, including the Eastern Catholics, right? But yeah. the Catholic Church was the one true church. Right. So it won't be that they are that they will remain orthodox and someone when they get to yeah. heaven let's say they'll remain muslim right, or something like right. that or whatever yeah. um yeah. it's that yeah they will be saved um you know well or god willing they will be saved right mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. will enter into heaven as a fully formed catholic finally yeah right? yeah at, at yeah. then you you of course have the beatific vision so you yeah um realize any any mistakes that you made along the way but but of course i, I would say especially in the case of the Orthodox with them having valid local churches, uh, they're definitely in a different category as, for example, a Protestant who would be yeah. um, martyred. So um, I, I do think, in fact, also that the majority of Orthodox don't have any kind of formal schismatic, yeah. formal, formally heretical positions or anything like that. Not, I, I don't think that they have any form to anything that they would maintain. Uh, that one would say is, is schism or heresy. So I don't think that they're culpable, the vast majority of them, um, for any, any things that were done in previous generations. So I think you're right. I mean, um, somebody who who is an Eastern Orthodox who uh, enters into their reward and beholds God in the beatific vision, they're, they're going to understand, okay, I, I, was, I was wrong in my concept, in my ecclesiology, but I mean, it's a good thing that God doesn't require us to be absolutely right in everything when it comes to theology to be admitted into uh, his embrace in the afterlife. That being said, you don't want to maintain formal schism or formal heresy because or you don't want to add form to your schism or heresy because that would then put a barrier between you and God. But here's, the, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Everybody thinks, a lot of people think that, well, if you just simply tell a person the truth and they reject it, that they've now added form to their schism and heresy. No, no. And this has been established for a very long time among Catholics as well. This was the case when, whenever we went to um, the Americas and we were sending people over there and doing all kinds of scandalous things in some cases, but then preaching the gospel to them, our theologians had to ask, okay, well, if the Native Americans reject the gospel, are they culpable for it? And they would, they would know, no, not necessarily, because yes, though we're telling them the truth about Jesus, and they're not turning away from their, the things that they believe that are not true, though we're telling them the true message, we're also mixing it in with all kinds of scandalous behavior. So it's not going to be convincing to them. So the point is that not only do you have to tell a person the truth, but for them to be culpable and guilty, it has to be given in such a way that it is convincing to them, and then they still choose to reject it. And that's not something we can determine individually. I have enough trouble reading my own heart, let alone somebody else's. So I don't know if, if they have ever reached that level where they've known convincingly that this is true, uh, but still reject it. I leave that between them and God. I just do what I know to do, and that is speak the truth and tell people to enter, enter into union with Rome. Um, but, but aside from that, it doesn't necessarily just mean that just because somebody has heard the, the true message, uh, as in the case of the Orthodox that you mentioned, that they're somehow all, automatically uh, formally in schism and formally in heresy. Yeah, Matthew, did you have a question you want to ask? 
Um, yeah, um, but it was more of a comment because I think that this uh, text from Cantate Domino uh, has um, can have some bad interpretation, and it's really good that Lumen Gentium 14 gave the more authentic interpretation of um, there being no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, and um, saying that uh, only if a person knew that the Catholic Church was the true Church of Christ and decided knowing that. Uh, to reject it, then such person could not be saved. And this, this is like I was waiting for this uh, for uh, for a long time. This, this should have been um, clarified way before Vatican II because this, it's so. Like, and it was. It was. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, it was by Pius the Ninth, for example, and Pius the Twelfth to an extent, but especially Pius the Ninth. Um, he he clarified it, even though prior to him, quite a few theologians had already done so under the auspices of Rome um they had already clarified this for uh, like i said for about 500 years uh but then yeah pius the ninth does clarify it and then vatican ii is just simply reiterating what's been going on for the last sure. 500 years but there had been centuries between uh, the council of florence and pius the ninth and uh this should have been clarified way before pius, pius the ninth as far as a magisterial it's... intervention probably yeah, yeah. 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 And so oh, this yeah. is, I think if you put in conjunction Lumen Gentium 14 and Lumen Gentium 16, you get the perfect uh, harmonious interpretation of what the church means by um, um, extra ecclesiam nulla, nulla salus. Uh, you, you get the, the, the perfect uh, uh, interpretation. And um, this doesn't uh, exclude, um, as people thought in the past, uh, Muslims, Jews, and uh, it takes into account invincible ignorance, and this should be made more clear to to people today. Yeah, uh, but all that being said, even though it's it's possible that God can unite them to the church in an extraordinary way, for us, we don't know what God is doing. All we know is to do what He has told us to do, and that is to go out and evangelize people and bring them to the church. So for us, anybody who, and I'm not saying this is you, I, but I know people out there who are doing this. They want to take what you said and what I've said here and use it as a reason not to evangelize. And yeah, I want to say, don't take my words and do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. Because there are people who are listening to this and try to do that. No, that's not what I'm saying. I think that what we're speaking about here when we say that a person can be united to the church, we're speaking about from God's perspective. From my perspective, I don't know what the, where they are. All I know is what God has told me to do in the Great Commission. Yeah, don't sure. gamble on someone else's salvation. <laughs> Why? Why do it? Yeah. Just speak the truth and let leave leave the rest to God to, mm -hmm. to, to determine. Yeah. I think this might be a good place to stop. Matthew, do you have any more questions? Because I think I've exhausted the questions I had. Perhaps one last question sure. on the question of a death penalty. Do you believe <laughs> this is part one. of the authentic magisterium or not? Um... You know, I, I do think that there are some aspects to the, the death penalty, at least it being um you, you know not opposed to uh the law of god i think that that is definitive in my opinion by the ordinary and universal magisterium um so i mean that it's not intrinsically evil i i think is definitive um whether or not it should be exercised today is is kind of the debate that's taking place with pope francis and john paul ii and a few others benedict the 16th um that's a little bit of a different discussion um and so i'm, I'm happy to agree to disagree or, or have discussions there on whether or not it should be exercised in today's context as long as we're still maintaining that in and of itself it's not intrinsically evil there's there's no way it could be intrinsically evil in and of itself since god himself commanded the death penalty and we even see it um reaffirmed in the new testament in the book of romans um where the government ha doesn't carry the sword in vain it, it has that um that ability but again whether or not that sword has to be exercised today is another matter and whether or not that sword has to take the form of capital punishment is another debate so again as long as we're maintaining that the capital punishment is not intrinsically evil we can have yeah. a discussion here because Pope Francis said it was inadmissible, which is not yeah, the same thing, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's getting thing. close. Right? Yeah, in inadmissible does not mean that this is um, intrinsically evil, and that's the problem that a lot of people are conflating the two. And he thinks it's inadmissible, and he gives you the rationale behind it. 
you may or may not agree with the rationale, but the rationale has to do with the penal system today, uh, mm -hmm. where he doesn't think it's necessary today. Okay, you, you could argue that. Doesn't mean he's necessarily right. I think this is a prudential decision as, on his point. Maybe, maybe he's wrong there. Um, but that's not him denying this on the level of him saying that this is intrinsically evil. And, and so you, anybody who would say that it is, they, they would need to demonstrate that. And I don't think that's been sufficiently done. He said it, it was contrary to human dignity. Uh, yeah, in life con the contrary to human dignity today in our society where he thinks that the penal system could allow for a person uh, to, to, to sufficiently protect people. He thinks it's contrary to human dignity because of that, not contrary to human dignity because this is intrinsically evil. That's the key. Why does he think it's, it's contrary to human dignity? That's the question. Well, he tells us because of the way the penal system is, not because it's intrinsically evil. So you'd have to show that he thinks it's contrary to human dignity because it's intrinsically evil. I don't think that's been done. Okay, so you would say that the new change in the catechism is not even part of the authentic magisterium. I don't think that it's a teaching. I think it is a prudential disciplinary decision. Um, and it being added to the catechism means nothing. Uh, the, the catechism has zero authoritative weight beyond the sources that it is relying on. Um, and the source here is a prudential decision, in my opinion. I don't, I don't think it's, um, I don't even think that it's a teaching. I don't, I don't think Pope Francis is teaching this. I think that this is a disciplinary decision uh, that he's expressing um, prudentially. And you may or may not agree with it. And again, that, that's, that's the debate that we can have. But for people to, number one, put this in the realm of a teaching, I already dispute that. And then to say that, He's teaching that it is intrinsically evil. I dispute that uh, as well, because I, I don't think that there's anything in there. The language about uh, this being contrary to human dignity, notwithstanding, I don't think there's anything in there to support that view. Yeah, and I just wanted to add in real quick too uh, the point that Michael made about the catechism. You know, the catechism is not just like, you know, a one, two knockout punch. Right. There is a lot of nuance that even goes to citing it. And even Matthew in, in the past, when we talked about lying, right, the definition of lying change in the catechism. Right. So there's there's nuance there. Um, uh, so, Michael, you know, sometimes I recommend to people instead, like if they're really, you know, if they're really they love reading, they, they, mm. they want to go mm. further into their studies. I direct them to Ludwig Ott's The Fundamentals mm. of Catholic Dogma. Mm. Um, and I don't know, maybe I, I feel I don't think this is heretical. It's not heretical, but I kind of like ought more than the catechism sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the catechism itself kind of notes that it, it's not necessarily supposed to be the be all and end all. In fact, it, it encourages even other catechisms. Not that ought is a catechism, but the concept is there. If it's encouraging other catechisms, it's obviously also encouraging other theological resources. And of course, um, ought, I think, is a good one. I don't think you have to be a die hard lover of the new catechism as long as you maintain that there's nothing in there that's heretical or evil <laughs> um and and I, i'm sure that's what you maintain but there there are some people out there that reject the catechism because they do think that there are things in it that are heretical or evil and i think that's problematic but if if as long as you recognize that everything in there is orthodox but you just prefer some other kind of source because you think it articulates things better. Yeah, that's fine as well. I do think that, it, that in the case of the catechism, though, though, though it in and of itself does not have any additional weight when it comes to its authority, one thing that I've never heard anyone note yet is this. Um, yes, the catechism doesn't offer any additional weight, but if it's being consistently used by Catholics throughout the centuries, I think that will end up adding authoritative weight to it by the fact that now the faithful have consistently received this and reception does increase the authoritative weight of something that even might be taught non-definitively. Um, so for example, if the faithful don't really receive very well consistently throughout the ages a non-definitive papal teaching, it's pretty low in the magisterial level. But then a, a, a teaching that is received very well by the faithful throughout the centuries on a non-definitive teaching, that's going to be higher in the scale of things. So I think that 
when I when I tell people, okay, well, that the catechism doesn't add any any weight in and of itself. I do want to say throughout the centuries, if we continue to use the catechism in the future, I think that actually might increase some of the weight of the non-definitive teachings in it. All right, Michael, Matthew, thank you so much for coming on to my show again. I appreciate yeah. it. This was great. And I think it's going to help a lot of people with just, you know, interpreting the magisterium and understanding what's going on in the Catholic Church today. Um, so obviously, Michael is the host and founder of Reason and Theology. Matthew, um, can you talk about some of the work that you're doing uh, just so people can find your resources? Yeah, so I'm a French apologist. I started working recently in September. Uh, my first book is coming out in uh, January or February. It's on Catholic apologetics. Uh, so the title is a bit provocative. It's uh, Be Rational, Become Catholics. Uh, and, uh, and my second book is on abortion. So I'm working also on pro-life apologetics. Uh, with the great help of uh, guys like Trenhorn, Christopher Kaiser, and et cetera. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a great adventure, and I'm glad to be doing it for the church. So. And remind me again, is the first book in French? Yes, but okay. it might be translated in the, in the future. Yeah. Okay, well, then when it's translated, I'll definitely buy it. <laughs> All right, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks.